This is section thirty six of Mark Twain, a biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, a biography by Albert Bigelow Payne. Volume one, part one, eighteen thirty five to eighteen sixty six. Chapter thirty six. Last mining days. It was late in July when he wrote, If I do not forget it, I will send you, per next mail, a pinch of decom, decomposed rock, which I pinched with thumb and finger from Wide West Ledge a while ago. Raish and I have secured two hundred out of a company with four hundred feet in it, which perhaps, the ledge I mean, is a spur from the W.W. W. Our shaft is about one hundred feet from the W.W. W. shaft. In order to get in, we agreed to sink thirty feet. We have sublet to another man for fifty feet, and we pay for powder and sharpening tools. This was the blind lead claim of roughing it, but the episode as set down in that book is somewhat dramatized. It is quite true that he visited and nursed Captain Nye while Higby was off following the cement ignis fatus, and that the wide west holdings were forfeited through neglect. But if the loss was regarded as a heavy one, the letters fail to show it. It is a matter of dispute today whether or not the claim was ever of any value. A well-known California author, Ella Sterling Cummins, author of The Story of the Files, etc., declares, No one need to fear that he ran any chance of being a millionaire through the Wide West Mine, for the writer, as a child, played over that historic spot and saw only a shut-down mill and desolate hole in the ground to mark the spot where over-hopeful men had sunk thousands and thousands that they never recovered. The blind lead episode, as related, is presumably a tale of what might have happened, a possibility rather than an actuality. It is vividly true in atmosphere, however, and forms a strong and natural climax for closing the mining episode, while the literary privilege warrants any liberties he may have taken for art's sake. In reality, the close of his mining career was not sudden and spectacular. It was a lingering close, a reluctant and gradual surrender. The Josh letters to the Enterprise had awakened at least a measure of interest, and Orion had not failed to identify their author when any promising occasion offered. As a result, certain tentative overtures had been made for similar material. Orion eagerly communicated such chances, for the money situation was becoming a desperate one. A letter from the Aurora Miner, written near the end of July, presents the situation very fully. An extract or two will be sufficient. My debts are greater than I thought for. I bought twenty-five dollars worth of clothing and sent twenty-five dollars to Higby in the cement diggings. I owe about forty-five dollars or fifty dollars, and have got about forty-five dollars in my pocket. But how in the hell I am going to live on something over one hundred dollars until October or November is singular. The fact is, I must have something to do, and that shortly, too. Now, write to the Sacramento Union folks, or to Marsh, and tell them I'll write as many letters a week as they want for ten dollars a week. My board must be paid. Tell them I have corresponded with the New Orleans Crescent and other papers, and the Enterprise. If they want letters from here, who'll run from morning till night collecting material cheaper? I'll write a short letter 
twice a week for the present for the age for five dollars per week now it has been a long time since i couldn't make my own living and it shall be a long time before i loaf another year nothing came of these possibilities but about this time barstow of the enterprise conferred with joseph t goodman editor and owner of the paper as to the advisability of adding the author of the josh letters to their local staff joe goodman who had as keen a literary perception as any man that ever pitched a journalistic tent on the pacific coast and there could be no higher praise than that looked over the letters and agreed with barstow that the man who wrote them had something in him two of the sketches in particular he thought promising one of them was a burlesque report of an egotistical lecturer who was referred to as professor personal pronoun it closed by stating that it was impossible to print his lecture in full as the type cases had run out of capital i's but it was the other sketch which settled goodman's decision it was also a burlesque report this time of a fourth of july oration it opened i was sired by the great american eagle and foaled by a continental dam this was followed by a string of stock patriotic phrases absurdly arranged but it was the opening itself that won goodman's heart that is the sort of thing we want he said write to him barstow and ask him if he wants to come up here barstow wrote offering twenty-five dollars a week a tempting sum this was at the end of july eighteen sixty two in roughing it we are led to believe that the author regarded this as a gift from heaven and accepted it straightway as a matter of fact he fasted and prayed a good while over the call to orion he wrote barstow has offered me the post as local reporter for the enterprise at twenty-five dollars a week and i have written him that i will let him know next mail if possible there was no desperate eagerness you see to break into literature even under those urgent conditions it meant the surrender of all hope in the minds the confession of another failure on august seventh he wrote again to orion he had written to barstow he said asking when they thought he might be needed he was playing for time to consider now i shall leave at midnight to-night alone and on foot for a walk of sixty or seventy miles through a totally uninhabited country and it is barely possible that mail facilities may prove infernally slow but do you write barstow that i have left here for a week or so and in case he should want me he must write me here or let me know through you so he had gone into the wilderness to fight out his battle alone but eight days later when he had returned there was still no decision in a letter to pamela of this date he refers playfully to the discomforts of his cabin and mentions a hope that he will spend the winter in san francisco but there is no reference in it to any newspaper prospects nor to the mines for that matter phillips howland and higby would seem to have given up by this time and he was camping with dan twing and a dog a combination amusingly described it is a pleasant enough letter but the note of discouragement creeps in i did think for a while of going home this fall but when i found that that was and had been the cherished intention and the darling aspiration every year of these old careworn californians for twelve weary years i felt a little uncomfortable so i stole a march on disappointment 
and said I would not go home this fall. This country suits me, and it shall suit me, whether or no. He was dying hard, desperately hard. How could he know, to paraphrase the old form of Christian comfort, that his end as a miner would mean, in another sphere, a brighter resurrection than even his rainbow imagination could paint? End of chapter 36 Last Mining Days Read by John Greenman This is section 37 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne. Volume 1, Part 1, 1835-1866. Chapter 37, The New Estate. It was the afternoon of a hot, dusty August day when a worn, travel-stained pilgrim drifted laggingly into the office of the Virginia City Enterprise, then in its new building on C Street, and loosening a heavy roll of blankets from his shoulders, dropped wearily into a chair. He wore a rusty slouch hat, no coat, a faded blue flannel shirt, a navy revolver, his trousers were hanging on his boot tops. A tangle of reddish-brown hair fell on his shoulders, and a mass of tawny beard, dingy with alkali dust, dropped halfway to his waist. Aurora lay one hundred and thirty miles from Virginia. He had walked that distance, carrying his heavy load. Editor Goodman was absent at the moment, but the other proprietor, Dennis E. McCarthy, signified that the caller might state his errand. The wanderer regarded him with a far-away look, and said absently, and with deliberation, "'My starboard leg seems to be unshipped. I'd like about one hundred yards of line. I think I am falling to pieces.' Then he added, "'I want to see Mr. Barstow or Mr. Goodman. My name is Clemens, and I've come to write for the paper. It was the master of the world's widest estate come to claim his kingdom. William Wright, who had won a wide celebrity on the coast as Dan de Quill, was in the editorial chair and took charge of the new arrival. He was going on a trip to the States soon. It was mainly on this account that the new man had been engaged. The Josh letters were very good, in Dan's opinion. He gave their author a cordial welcome, and took him around to his boarding-place. It was the beginning of an association that continued during Samuel Clemens' stay in Virginia City, and of a friendship that lasted many years. The Territorial Enterprise was one of the most remarkable frontier papers ever published. Its editor-in-chief, Joseph Goodman, was a man with rare appreciation, wide human understanding, and a comprehensive newspaper policy. Being a young man, he had no policy, in fact, beyond the general purpose that his paper should be a forum for absolutely free speech, provided any serious statement it contained was based upon knowledge. His instructions to the new reporter were about as follows. Never say we learn so-and-so, or it is rumored, or we understand so-and-so. We go to headquarters and get the absolute facts, then speak out and say it is so-and-so. In the one case you are likely to be shot, and in the other you are pretty certain to be, but you will preserve the public confidence. Goodman was not new to the West. He had come to California as a boy, and had been a miner, explorer, printer, and contributor by turns. Early in '61, when the Comstock Lode, named for its discoverer, Henry T. P. Comstock, a half-crazy miner who realized very little from his stupendous find, was new and Virginia in the first flush of its monster boom, he and Dennis McCarthy had scraped together a few dollars and bought the paper. It had been a hand-to-hand -hand struggle for a while, but in a brief two years, from a starving sheet and a shanty, the Enterprise, with new building, new presses, and a corps of swift compositors brought up from San Francisco, 
had become altogether metropolitan, as well as the most widely considered paper on the coast. It had been borne upward by the Comstock tide, though its fearless, picturesque utterance would have given it distinction anywhere. Goodman himself was a fine, forceful writer, and Dan de Quille and R. M. Daggett, afterward United States Minister to Hawaii, were representative of Enterprise men. The Comstock of that day became famous for its journalism. Associated with the Virginia papers then, or soon afterward, were such men as Tom Fitch, the silver-tongued orator, Alf Doten, W. J. Forbes, C. C. Goodwin, H. R. McGells, Clement T. Rice, Arthur McEwen, and Sam Davis, a great array indeed for a new territory. Samuel Clemens fitted precisely into this group. He added the fresh, rugged vigor of thought and expression that was the very essence of the Comstock, which was, like every other frontier mining camp, only on a more lavish, more overwhelming scale. There was no uncertainty about the Comstock. The silver and gold were there. Flanking the foot of Mount Davidson, the towns of Gold Hill and Virginia, and the long street between, were fairly underburrowed and underpinned by the gigantic mining construction of that opulent lode whose treasures were actually glutting the mineral markets of the world. The streets overhead seethed and swarmed with miners, mine owners, and adventurers, riotous, rollicking children of fortune, always ready to drink and make merry, as eager in their pursuit of pleasure as of gold. Comstockers would always laugh at a joke, the rougher the better. The town of Virginia itself was just a huge joke to most of them. Everybody had money, everybody wanted to laugh and have a good time. The enterprise, Comstock to the backbone, did what it could to help things along. It was a sort of free ring, with everyone for himself. Goodman let the boys write and print in accordance with their own ideas upon any subject. Often they wrote of each other, squibs and burlesques, which gratified the Comstock far more than mere news. The indifference to news was noble, none the less so because it was so blissfully unconscious. Editors Mark or Dan would dismiss a murder with a couple of inches and sit down and fill up a column with a fancy sketch. Arthur McEwen. It was the proper classroom for Mark Twain, an encouraging audience and free utterance. Fortune could have devised nothing better for him than that. He was peculiarly fitted for the position. Unspoiled humanity appealed to him, and the Comstock presented human nature in its earliest landscape forms. Furthermore, the Comstock was essentially optimistic. So was he. Any hole in the ground to him held a possible, even a probable, fortune. His pilot memory became a valuable asset in news-gathering, remembering marks, banks, sounding, and other river detail belonged apparently in the same category of attainments as remembering items and localities of news. He could travel all day without a notebook, and at night reproduce the day's budget, or at least the picturesqueness of it, without error. He was presently accounted a good reporter, except where statistics, measurements and figures, were concerned. These he gave a lick and a promise, according to De Quille, who wrote afterward of their associations. De Quille says further, Mark and I agreed well in our work, which we divided when there was a rush of events, but we often cruised in company, he taking the items of news he could handle best, and I such as I felt competent to work up. However, we wrote at the same table and frequently helped each other with such suggestions as occurred to us during the brief consultations we held in regard to the handling of any matters of importance. Never was there an angry word between us in all the time we worked together." De Quill tells how Clemens clipped items with a knife when there were no scissors handy, and slashed through on the top of his desk, which in time took on the semblance of a huge polar star, spiritedly dashing forth a thousand rays. The author of Roughing It has given us a better picture of the Virginia city of those days and his work there than anyone else will ever write. 
he has made us feel the general spirit of affluence that prevailed how the problem was not to get money but to spend it how feet in any one of a hundred mines could be had for the asking how such shares were offered like apples or cigars or bonbons as a natural matter of courtesy when one happened to have his supply in view how any one connected with a newspaper would have stocks thrust upon him and how in a brief time he had acquired a trunk full of such riches and usually had something to sell when any of the claims made a stir on the market he has told us of the desperadoes and their trifling regard for human life and preserved other elemental characters of these prodigal days the funeral of buck fanshaw that amazing masterpiece is a complete epitome of the social frontier it would not be the part of wisdom to attempt another inclusive presentation of comstock conditions we may only hope to add a few details of history justified now by time and circumstances to supplement the picture with certain data of personality preserved from the drift of years end of chapter thirty seven the new estate read by john greenman this is section thirty eight of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne volume one part one eighteen thirty five to eighteen sixty six chapter thirty eight one of the staff the new reporter found acquaintance easy the office force was like one family among which there was no line of caste proprietors editors and printers were social equals there was little ceremony among them none at all outside of the office the paper went to press at two in the morning then all the staff and all the compositors gathered themselves together in the composing room and drank beer and sang the popular war songs of the day until dawn s l c in nineteen o eight samuel clemens immediately became sam or josh to his associates just as de quill was dan and goodman joe he found that he disliked the name of josh and as he did not sign it again it was presently dropped the office and virginia city generally quickly grew fond of him delighting in his originality and measured speech enterprise readers began to identify his work then unsigned and to enjoy its fresh phrasing even when it was only the usual local item or mining notice true to its name and reputation the paper had added a new attraction it was only a brief time after his arrival in virginia city that clemens began the series of hoaxes which would carry his reputation not always in an enviable fashion across the sierras and down the pacific coast with one exception these are lost to-day for so far as known there is not a single file of the enterprise in existence only a few stray copies and clippings are preserved and we know the story of some of these literary pranks and of their results they were usually intended as a special punishment of some particular individual or paper or locality but victims were gathered by the wholesale in their seductive web mark twain himself in his book of sketches has set down something concerning the first of these the petrified man and of another my bloody massacre but in neither case has he told it all the petrified man hoax was directed at an official named sewell a coroner and justice of the peace at humboldt who had been pompously indifferent in the matter of supplying news the story told with great circumstance and apparent care as to detail related the finding of a petrified prehistoric man partially embedded in a rock in a cave in the desert more than one hundred miles from humboldt and how sewell had made the perilous five-day journey in the alkali waste to hold an inquest over a man that had been dead three hundred years also how 
with that delicacy so characteristic of him sewell had forbidden the miners from blasting him from his position the account further stated that the hands of the deceased were arranged in a peculiar fashion and the description of the arrangement was so skillfully woven in with other matters that at first or even second reading one might not see that the position indicated was the ancient one which begins with the thumb at the nose and in many ages has been used impolitely to express ridicule and the word sold but the description was a shade too ingenious the author expected that the exchanges would see the jolt and perhaps assist in the fun he would have with sewell he did not contemplate a joke on the papers themselves as a matter of fact no one saw the cell and most of the papers printed his story of the petrified man as a genuine discovery this was a surprise and a momentary disappointment then he realized that he had builded better than he knew he gathered up a bundle of the exchanges and sent them to sewell also he sent marked copies to scientific men in various parts of the united states the papers had taken it seriously perhaps the scientists would some of them did and sewell's days became unhappy because of letters received asking further information as literature the effort did not rank high and as a trick on an obscure official it was hardly worth while but as a joke on the coast exchanges and press generally it was greatly regarded and its author though as yet unnamed acquired prestige inquiries began to be made as to who was the smart chap in virginia that did these things the papers became wary and read enterprise items twice before clipping them clemens turned his attention to other matters to lull suspicion the great dutch nick massacre did not follow until a year later reference has already been made to the comstock's delight and humor of a positive sort the practical joke was legal tender in virginia one might protest and swear but he must take it an example of comstock humor regarded as the finest assay is an incident still told of leslie blackburn and pat holland two gay men about town they were coming down c street one morning when they saw some fine watermelons on a fruit stand at the international hotel corner watermelons were rare and costly in that day and locality and these were worth three dollars apiece blackburn said pat let's get one of those watermelons you engage that fellow in conversation while i stand at the corner where i can step around out of sight easily when you've got him interested point to something on the back shelf and pitch me a melon this appealed to holland and he carried out his part of the plan perfectly but when he pitched the watermelon blackburn simply put his hands in his pockets stepped around the corner leaving the melon a fearful disaster on the pavement it was almost impossible for pat to explain to the fruit man why he pitched away a three-dollar melon like that even after paying for it and it was still more trying also more expensive to explain to the boys facing the various bars along c street sam clemens himself a practical joker in his youth found a healthy delight in this knock-down humor of the comstock it appealed to his vigorous elemental nature he seldom indulged physically in such things but his printed squibs and hoaxes and his keen love of the ridiculous placed him in the joker class while his prompt temper droll manner and rare gift of invective made him an enticing victim among the enterprise compositors was one by the name of stephen e gillis steve of course one of the fighting gillises a small fearless young fellow handsome quick of wit with eyes like needle-points steve weighed only ninety-five pounds mark twain once wrote of him but it was well known throughout the territory that with his fists he could whip anybody that walked on two legs let his weight and science be what they might clemens was fond of steve gillis from the first 
the two became closely associated in time and were always bosom friends but steve was a merciless joker and never as long as they were together could he resist the temptation of making sam swear claiming that his profanity was grander than any music a word here about mark twain's profanity born with a matchless gift of phrase the printing office the river and the mines had developed it in a rare perfection to hear him denounce a thing was to give one the fierce searching delight of galvanic waves every characterization seemed the most perfect fit possible until he applied the next and somehow his profanity was seldom an offense it was not mere idle swearing it seemed almost genuine and serious his selection of epithet was always dignified and stately from whatever source and it might be from the bible or the gutter someone has defined dirt as misplaced matter it is perhaps the greatest definition ever uttered it is absolutely universal in its application and it recurs now remembering mark twain's profanity for it was rarely misplaced hence it did not often offend it seemed in fact the safety valve of his high-pressure intellectual engine when he had blown off he was always calm gentle forgiving and even tender once following an outburst he said placidly in certain trying circumstances urgent circumstances desperate circumstances profanity furnishes a relief denied even to prayer it seems proper to add that it is not the purpose of this work to magnify or modify or excuse that extreme example of humankind which forms its chief subject but to set him down as he was inadequately of course but with good conscience and clear intent led by steve gillis the enterprise force used to devise tricks to set him going one of these was to hide articles from his desk he detested the work necessary to the care of a lamp and wrote by the light of a candle to hide sam's candle was a sure way to get prompt and vigorous return he would look for it a little then he would begin a slow circular walk a habit acquired in the limitations of the pilot-house and his denunciation of the thieves was like a great orchestration of wrong by and by the office boy supposedly innocent would find another for him and all would be forgotten he made a placard labeled with fearful threats and anathemas warning anyone against touching his candle but one night both the placard and the candle were gone now among his virginia acquaintances was a young minister a mr rising the fragile gentle new fledgling of the buck fanshaw episode clemens greatly admired mr rising's evident sincerity and the young minister had quickly recognized the new reporter's superiority of mind now and then he came to the office to call on him unfortunately he happened to step in just at that moment when infuriated by the latest theft of his property samuel clemens was engaged in his rotary denunciation of the criminals oblivious of every other circumstance mr rising stood spellbound by this to him new phase of genius and at last his friend became dimly aware of him he did not halt in his scathing treadmill and continued in the slow monotone of speech i know mr rising i know it's wicked to talk like this i know it is wrong i know i shall certainly go to hell for it but if you had a candle mr rising and those thieves should carry it off every night i know that you would say just as i say mr rising god damned their impenitent souls 
may they roast in hell for a million years the little clergyman caught his breath maybe i should mr clemens he replied but i should try to say forgive them father they know not what they do oh well if you put it on the ground that they are just fools that alters the case as i am one of that class myself come in and we'll try to forgive them and forget about it mark twain had a good many experiences with young ministers he was always fond of them and they often sought him out once long afterward at a hotel he wanted a boy to polish his shoes and had rung a number of times without getting any response presently he thought he heard somebody approaching in the hall outside he flung open the door and a small youngish-looking person who seemed to have been hesitating at the door made a movement as though to depart hastily clemens grabbed him by the collar look here he said i've been waiting and ringing here for half an hour now i want you to take those shoes and polish them quick do you hear the slim youthful person trembled a good deal and said i would mr clemens i would indeed sir if i could but i'm a minister of the gospel and i'm not prepared for such work end of chapter thirty eight one of the staff read by john greenman this is section thirty nine of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne volume one part one eighteen thirty five to eighteen sixty six chapter thirty nine philosophy and poetry there was a side to samuel clemens that in those days few of his associates saw this was the poetic the philosophic the contemplative side joseph goodman recognized this phase of his character and while he perhaps did not regard it as a future literary asset he delighted in it and in their hours of quiet association together encouraged its exhibition it is rather curious that with all his literary penetration goodman did not dream of a future celebrity for clemens he afterward said if i had been asked to prophesy which of the two men dan de quill or sam would become distinguished i should have said de quill dan was talented industrious and for that time and place brilliant of course i recognized the unusualness of sam's gifts but he was eccentric and seemed to lack industry it is not likely that i should have prophesied fame for him then goodman like mcfarlane in cincinnati half a dozen years before though by a different method discovered and developed the deeper vein often the two dining together in a french restaurant discussed life subtler philosophies recalled various phases of human history remembered and recited the poems that gave them especial enjoyment the burial of moses with its noble phrasing and majestic imagery appealed strongly to clemens and he recited it with great power the first stanza in particular always stirred him and it stirred his hearer as well with eyes half closed and chin lifted a lighted cigar between his fingers he would lose himself in the music of the stately lines by nemo's lonely mountain on this side jordan's wave in a vale in the land of moab there lies a lonely grave and no man knows that sepulchre and no man saw it e'er for the angels of god upturned the sod and laid the dead man there another stanza that he cared for almost as much was the one beginning and had he not high honor the hillside for a pall to lie in state 
while angels wait with stars for tapers tall and the dark rock pines like tossing plumes over his bier to wave and god's own hand in that lonely land to lay him in the grave without doubt he was moved to emulate the simple grandeur of that poem for he often repeated it in those days and somewhat later we find it copied into his notebook in full it would seem to have become to him a sort of literary touchstone and in some measure it may be regarded as accountable for the fact that in the fullness of time he made use of the purest english of any modern writer these are goodman's words though william dean howells has said them also in substance and brander matthews and many others who know about such things goodman adds the simplicity and beauty of his style are almost without a parallel except in the common version of the bible which is also true one is reminded of what macaulay said of milton there would seem at first sight to be no more in his words than in other words but they are words of enchantment no sooner are they pronounced than the past is present and the distance near new forms of beauty start at once into existence and all the burial places of the memory give up their dead one drifts ahead remembering these things the triumph of words the mastery of phrases lay all before him at the time of which we are writing now he was twenty-seven at that age rudyard kipling had reached his meridian samuel clemens was still in the classroom everything came as a lesson phrase form aspect and combination nothing escaped unvalued the poetic phase of things particularly impressed him once at a dinner with goodman when the lamplight from the chandelier struck down through the claret on the tablecloth in a great red stain he pointed to it dramatically look joe he said the angry tint of wine it was at one of these private sessions late in sixty two that clemens proposed to report the coming meeting of the carson legislature he knew nothing of such work and had small knowledge of parliamentary proceedings formerly it had been done by a man named gillespie but gillespie was now clerk of the house goodman hesitated then remembering that whether clemens got the reports right or not he would at least make them readable agreed to let him undertake the work end of chapter thirty nine philosophy and poetry read by john greenman This is section 40 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne. Volume 1, Part 1, 1835 to 1866. Chapter 40. Mark Twain. The early Nevada legislature was an interesting assembly. All state legislatures are that, and this was a mining frontier. No attempt can be made to describe it. It was chiefly distinguished for a large ignorance of procedure, a wide latitude of speech, a noble appreciation of humor, and plenty of brains. How fortunate Mark Twain was in his schooling to be kept away from institutional training, to be placed in one after another of those universities of life where the sole curriculum is the study of the native inclinations and activities of mankind sometimes in after years he used to regret the lack of systemic training well for him and for us that he escaped that blight for the study of human nature the nevada assembly was a veritable lecture-room in it his understanding his wit his phrasing his self-assuredness grew like jack's beanstalk which in time was ready to break through into a land above the sky he made some curious blunders in his reports in the beginning but he was so frank in his ignorance and in his confession of it that the very unsophistication of his early letters became their chief charm 
gillespie coached him on parliamentary matters and in time the reports became technically as well as artistically good clemens in return christened gillespie young jefferson's manual a title which he bore rather proudly indeed for many years another entitlement growing out of those early reports and possibly less satisfactory to its owner was the one accorded to clement t rice of the virginia city union rice knew the legislative work perfectly and concluded to poke fun at the enterprise letters but this was a mistake clemens in his next letter declared that rice's reports might be parliamentary enough but that they covered with glittering technicalities the most festering mass of misstatement and even crime he avowed that they were wholly untrustworthy dubbed the author of them the unreliable and in future letters never referred to him by any other term carson and the comstock and the papers of the coast delighted in this burlesque journalistic warfare and rice was the unreliable for life rice and clemens it should be said though rivals were the best of friends and there was never any real animosity between them clemens quickly became a favorite with the members his sharp letters with their amusing turn of phrase and their sincerity won general friendship jack simmons speaker of the house and billy claggett the humboldt delegation were his special cronies and kept him on the inside of the political machine claggett had remained in unionville after the mining venture warned his keokuk sweetheart and settled down into politics and law in due time he would become a leading light and go to congress he was already a notable figure of forceful eloquence and tousled unkempt hair simmons claggett and clemens were easily the three conspicuous figures of the session it must have been gratifying to the former prospector and miner to come back to carson city a person of consequence where less than a year before he had been regarded as no more than an amusing indolent fellow a figure to smile at but unimportant there is a photograph extant of clemens and his friends claggett and simmons in a group and we gather from it that he now arrayed himself in a long broadcloth cloak a starched shirt and polished boots once more he had become the glass of fashion that he had been on the river he made his residence with orion whose wife and little daughter jenny had by this time come out from the states sister molly as wife of the acting governor was presently social leader of the little capital her brilliant brother-in-law its chief ornament his merriment and songs and good nature made him a favorite guest his lines had fallen in pleasant places he could afford to smile at the hard esmeralda days he was not altogether satisfied his letters copied and quoted along the coast were unsigned they were easily identified with one another but not with a personality he realized that to build a reputation it was necessary to fasten it to an individuality a name he gave the matter a good deal of thought he did not consider the use of his own name the nom de plume was the fashion of the time he wanted something brief crisp definite unforgettable he tried over a good many combinations in his mind but none seemed convincing just then this was early in eighteen sixty three news came to him that the old pilot he had wounded by his satire isaiah sellers was dead at once the pen name of captain sellers recurred to him that was it that was the sort of name he wanted it was not trivial it had all the qualities sellers would never need it again clemens decided he would give it a new meaning and new association in this faraway land he went up to virginia city joe he said to goodman i want to sign my articles i want to be identified to a wider audience all right sam what name do you want to use josh no i want to sign them mark twain it is an old river term a leadsman's call 
signifying two fathoms, twelve feet. It has a richness about it. It was always a pleasant sound for a pilot to hear on a dark night. It meant safe water. He did not then mention that Captain Isaiah Sellers had used and dropped the name. He was ashamed of his part in that episode, and the offense was still too recent for confession. Goodman considered a moment. "'Very well, Sam,' he said. "'That sounds like a good name.' It was indeed a good name. In all the nomenclature of the world no more forceful combination of words could have been selected to express the man for whom they stood. The name Mark Twain is as infinite, as fundamental, as that of John Smith, without the latter's wasting distribution of strength. If all the prestige in the name of John Smith were combined in a single individual, its dynamic energy might give it the carrying power of Mark Twain. Let this be as it may, it has proven the greatest nom de plume ever chosen, a name exactly in accord with the man, his work, and his career. It is not surprising that Goodman did not recognize this at the moment. We should not guess the force that lies in a twelve-inch shell if we had never seen one before or heard of its seismic destruction. We should have to wait and see it fired and take account of the result. It was first signed to a Carson letter bearing date of February 2, 1863, and from that time was attached to all Samuel Clemens work. The work was neither better nor worse than before, but it had suddenly acquired identification and special interest. Members of the legislature and friends in Virginia and Carson immediately began to address him as Mark. The papers of the coast took it up, and within a period to be measured by weeks he was no longer Sam or Clemens or that bright chap on the Enterprise, but Mark, Mark Twain. No nom de plume was ever so quickly and generally accepted as that. De Quill, returning from the East after an absence of several months, found his room and deskmate with the distinction of a new name and fame. It is curious that in the letters to the home folks preserved from that period there is no mention of his new title and its success. In fact, the writer rarely speaks of his work at all, and is more inclined to tell of the mining shares he has accumulated, their present and prospective values. However, many of the letters are undoubtedly missing. Such as have been preserved are rather airy epistles full of his abounding joy of life and good nature. Also, they bear evidence of the renewal of his old river habit of sending money home, twenty dollars in each letter, with intervals of a week or so between. End of chapter 40 Mark Twain Read by John Greenman This is section 41 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne. Volume 1, Part 1, 1835 to 1866. Chapter 41 The Cream of Comstock Humor. With the adjournment of the legislature, Samuel Clemens returned to Virginia City distinctly a notability, Mark Twain. He was regarded as leading man on the enterprise, which in itself was high distinction on the Comstock, while his improved dress and increased prosperity commanded additional respect. When visitors of note came along, well-known actors, lecturers, politicians, he was introduced as one of the Comstock features which it was proper to see, along with Ophir and Gould and Curry Mines and the new hundred-stamp quartz mill. He was rather grieved and hurt, therefore, when, after several collections had been taken up in the Enterprise office to present various members of the staff with meerschaum pipes, none had come to him. He mentioned this apparent slight to Steve Gillis. "'Nobody ever gives me a meerschaum pipe,' he said plaintively. "'Don't I deserve one yet?' Unhappy day! 
to that remorseless creature steve gillis this was a golden opportunity for deviltry of a kind that delighted his soul this is the story precisely as gillis himself told it to the writer of these annals more than a generation later there was a german kept a cigar store in virginia city and always had a fine assortment of meerschaum pipes these pipes usually cost anywhere from forty to seventy-five dollars and one day dennis mccarthy and i were walking by the old german's place and stopped to look in at the display in the window among other things there was one large imitation meerschaum with a high bowl and a long stem marked a dollar and a half i decided that that would be just the pipe for sam we went in and bought it also a very much longer stem i think the stem alone cost three dollars then we had a little german silver plate engraved with mark's name on it and by whom presented and made preparations for the presentation charlie pope afterward proprietor of pope's theater in st louis was playing at the opera house at the time and we engaged him to make the presentation speech then we let in dan de quill mark's closest friend to act the part of judas to tell mark privately that he was going to be presented with a fine pipe so that he could have a speech prepared in reply to pope's it was awful low down in dan we arranged to have the affair come off in the saloon beneath the opera house after the play was over everything went off handsomely but it was a pretty remorseful occasion and some of us had a hang-dog look for sam took it in such sincerity and had prepared one of the most beautiful speeches i ever heard him make pope's presentation too was beautifully done he told sam how his friends all loved him and that this pipe purchased at so great an expense was but a small token of their affection but sam's reply which was supposed to be impromptu actually brought the tears to the eyes of some of us and he was interrupted every other minute with applause i never felt so sorry for anybody still we were bent on seeing the thing through after sam's speech was finished he ordered expensive wines champagne and sparkling moselle then we went out to do the town and kept things going until morning to drown our sorrow well next day of course we started in to color the pipe it wouldn't color any more than a piece of chalk which was about all it was sam would smoke and smoke and complain that it didn't seem to taste right and that it wouldn't color finally dennis said to him one day oh sam don't you know that's just a damn old eggshell and that the boys bought it for a dollar and a half and presented you with it for a joke then sam was furious and we laid the whole thing on dan de quill he had a thundercloud on his face when he started up for the local room where dan was he went in and closed the door behind him and locked it and put the key in his pocket an awful sign dan was there alone writing at his table sam said dan did you know when you invited me to make that speech that those fellows were going to give me a bogus pipe there was no way for dan to escape and he confessed sam walked up and down the floor as if trying to decide which way to slay dan finally he said oh dan to think that you my dearest friend who knew how little money i had and how hard i would work to prepare a speech that would show my gratitude to my friends should be the traitor the judas to betray me with a kiss dan i never want to look on your face again you knew i would spend every dollar i had on those pirates when i couldn't afford to spend anything and yet you let me do it you aided and abetted their diabolical plan and you even got me to get up that damn speech to make the thing still more ridiculous of course dan felt terribly 
and tried to defend himself by saying that they were really going to present him with a fine pipe a genuine one this time but sam at first refused to be comforted and when a few days later i went in with the pipe and said sam here's the pipe the boys meant to give you all the time and tried to apologize he looked around a little coldly and said is that another of those bogus old pipes he accepted it though and general peace was restored one day soon after he said to me steve do you know that i think that that bogus pipe smokes as about as well as the good one many years later this was in his home at hartford and joe goodman was present mark twain one day came upon the old imitation pipe joe he said that was a cruel cruel trick the boys played on me but for the feeling i had during the moment when they presented me with that pipe and when charlie pope was making his speech and i was making my reply to it for the memory of that feeling now that pipe is more precious to me than any pipe in the world eighteen hundred and sixty three was flood tide on the comstock every mine was working full blast every mill was roaring and crunching turning out streams of silver and gold a little while ago an old resident wrote when i close my eyes i hear again the respirations of hoisting engines and the roar of stamps i can see the camels after midnight packing in salt i can see again the jam of teams on c street and hear the anathemas of the drivers all the mighty work that went on in order to lure the treasures from the deep chambers of the great load and to bring enlightenment to the desert those were lively times in the midst of one of his letters home mark twain interrupts himself to say i have just heard five pistol shots down the street as such things are in my line i will go and see about it and in a postscript added a few hours later five a m the pistol shot did its work well one man a jackson county missourian shot two of my friends police officers through the heart both died within three minutes the murderer's name is john campbell mark and i had our hands full says de quill and no grass grew under our feet in answer to some stray criticism of their policy they printed a sort of editorial manifesto our duty is to keep the universe thoroughly posted concerning murders and street fights and balls and theaters and pack trains and churches and lectures and schoolhouses and city military affairs and highway robberies and bible societies and hay wagons and the thousand other things which it is in the province of local reporters to keep track of and magnify into undue importance for the instruction of the readers of a great daily newspaper it is easy to recognize mark twain's hand in that compendium of labor which in spite of its amusing apposition was literally true and so intended probably with no special thought of humor in its construction it may be said as well here as anywhere that it was not mark twain's habit to strive for humor he saw facts at curious angles and phrased them accordingly in virginia city he mingled with the turmoil of the comstock and set down what he saw and thought in his native speech the comstock ready to laugh found delight in his expression and discovered a vast humor in his most earnest statements on the other hand there were times when the humor was intended and missed its purpose we have already recalled the instance of the petrified man hoax which was taken seriously but the empire city massacre burlesque found an acceptance that even its author considered serious for a time 
it is remembered today in virginia city as the chief incident of mark twain's comstock career this literary bomb really had two objects one of which was to punish the san francisco bulletin for its persistent attacks on washoe interests the other though this was merely incidental to direct an unpleasant attention to a certain carson saloon the magnolia which was supposed to dispense whiskey of the forty rod brand that is a liquor warranted to kill at that range it was the bulletin that was to be made especially ridiculous this paper had been particularly disagreeable concerning the dividend cooking system of certain of the comstock mines at the same time calling invidious attention to safer investments in california stocks samuel clemens with half a trunkful of comstock shares had cultivated a distaste for california things in general in a letter of that time he says how i hate everything that looks or tastes or smells like california with his customary fickleness of soul he was glorifying california less than a year later but for the moment he could see no good in that nazareth to his great satisfaction one of the leading california corporations the spring valley water company cooked a dividend of its own about this time resulting in disaster to a number of guileless investors who were on the wrong side of the subsequent crash this afforded an inviting opportunity for reprisal with goodman's consent he planned for the california papers and the bulletin in particular a punishment which he determined to make sufficiently severe he believed the papers of that state had forgotten his earlier offenses and the result would show he was not mistaken there was a point on the carson river four miles from carson city known as dutch nicks and also as empire city the two being identical there was no forest there of any sort nothing but sagebrush in the one cabin there lived a bachelor with no household everybody in virginia and carson of course knew these things mark twain now prepared a most lurid and graphic account of how one philip hopkins living just at the edge of the great pine forest which lies between empire city and dutch nicks had suddenly gone insane and murderously assaulted his entire family consisting of his wife and their nine children ranging in ages from one to nineteen years the wife had been slain outright also seven of the children the other two might recover the murder had been committed in the most brutal and ghastly fashion after which hopkins had scalped his wife leapt on a horse cut his own throat from ear to ear and ridden four miles into carson city dropping dead at last in front of the magnolia saloon the red-haired scalp of his wife still clutched in his gory hand the article further stated that the cause of mr hopkins insanity was pecuniary loss he having withdrawn his savings from safe comstock investments and through the advice of a relative one of the editors of the san francisco bulletin invested them in the spring valley water company this absurd tale with startling headlines appeared in the enterprise in its issue of october twenty eighth eighteen sixty three it was not expected that any one in virginia city or carson city would for a moment take any stock in the wild invention yet so graphic was it that nine out of ten on first reading never stopped to consider the entire impossibility of the locality and circumstance even when these things were pointed out many readers at first refused to confess themselves sold as for the bulletin and other california papers they were taken in completely and were furious many of them wrote and demanded the immediate discharge of its author announcing that they would never copy another line from the enterprise or exchange with it or have further relations with a paper that had mark twain on its staff citizens were mad too and cut off their subscriptions the joker was in despair oh joe he said i have ruined your business and the only reparation i can make is to resign you can never recover from this blow while i am on the paper 
nonsense replied goodman we can furnish the people with news but we can't supply them with sense only time can do that the flurry will pass you just go ahead we'll win out in the long run but the offender was in torture he could not sleep dan dan he said i am being burned alive on both sides of the mountains mark said dan it will all blow over this item of yours will be remembered and talked about when the rest of your enterprise work is forgotten both goodman and de quill were right in a month papers and people had forgotten their humiliation and laughed the dutch nick massacre gave to its perpetrator and to the enterprise an added vogue for full text of the dutch nick hoax see appendix c at the end of last volume also for an anecdote concerning a reporting excursion made by alf doten and mark twain end of chapter forty one the cream of comstock humor read by john greenman this is section forty two of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne volume one part one eighteen thirty five to eighteen sixty six chapter forty two repertorial days reference has already been made to the fashion among virginia city papers of permitting reporters to use the editorial columns for ridicule of one another this custom was especially in vogue during the period when dan de quill and mark twain and the unreliable were the shining journalistic lights of the comstock scarcely a week went by that some apparently venomous squib or fling or long burlesque assault did not appear either in the union or the enterprise with one of those jokers as its author and another as its target in one of his home letters of that year mark twain says i have just finished writing up my report for the morning paper and giving the unreliable a column of advice about how to conduct himself in church the advice was such as to call for a reprisal but it apparently made no difference in personal relations for a few weeks later he is with the unreliable in san francisco seeing life in the metropolis fairly swimming in its delights unable to resist reporting them to his mother we fag ourselves completely out every day and go to sleep without rocking every night when i go down montgomery street shaking hands with tom dick and harry it is just like being on main street in hannibal and meeting the old familiar faces i do hate to go back to washu we take trips across the bay to oakland and down to san leandro and alameda and we go out to the willows and hayes park and fort point and up to benicia and yesterday we were invited out on a yachting excursion and had a sail in the fastest yacht on the pacific coast rice says oh no we are not having any fun mark oh no i reckon it's somebody else it's probably the gentleman in the wagon popular slang phrase and when i invite rice to the lick house to dinner the proprietor sends us champagne and claret and then we do put on the most disgusting airs the unreliable says our caliber is too light we can't stand it to be noticed three days later he adds that he is going sorrowfully to the snows and the deserts of washu but that he has lived like a lord to make up for two years of privation twenty dollars is enclosed in each of these letters probably as a bribe to jane clemens to be lenient with his prodigalities which in his youthful love of display he could not bring himself to conceal 
but apparently the salve was futile, for in another letter, a month later, he complains that his mother is slinging insinuations at him again, such as, where did you get that money, and the company I kept in San Francisco. He explains, why, I sold wildcat mining ground that was given me, and my credit was always good at the bank for two thousand or three thousand dollars, and I never gamble in any shape or manner, and never drink anything stronger than claret and lager beer, which conduct is regarded as miraculously temperate in this place. As for company, I went in the very best company to be found in San Francisco. I always move in the best society in Virginia, and have a reputation to preserve. He closes by assuring her that he will be more careful in future, and that she need never fear, but that he will keep her expenses paid. Then he cannot refrain from adding one more item of his lavish life. Put in my washing, and it costs me one hundred dollars a month to live. De Quill had not missed the opportunity of his comrade's absence to pay off some old scores. At the end of the editorial column of the Enterprise on the day following his departure, he denounced the absent one and his protégé, the unreliable, after the intemperate fashion of the day. It is to be regretted that such scrubs are ever permitted to visit the bay, as the inevitable effect will be to destroy that exalted opinion of the manners and morality of our people, which was inspired by the conduct of our senior editor, which is to say, Dan himself. The diatribe closed with a really graceful poem, and the whole was no doubt highly regarded by the Enterprise readers. What revenge Mark Twain took on his return has not been recorded, but it was probably prompt and adequate, or he may have left it to the unreliable. It was clearly a mistake, however, to leave his own local work in the hands of that properly named person a little later. Clemens was laid up with a cold, and Rice assured him on his sacred honor that he would attend faithfully to the Enterprise locals, along with his own Union items. He did this, but he had been nursing old injuries too long. What was Mark Twain's amazement on looking over the Enterprise next morning to find under the heading Apologetic a statement over his own nom de plume, purporting to be an apology for all the sins of ridicule to the various injured ones? To Mayor Eric, Honorable William Stewart, Marshal Perry, Honorable J. B. Winters, Mr. Olin, and Samuel Wetherill, besides a host of others whom we have ridiculed from behind the shelter of our repertorial position, we say to these gentlemen we acknowledge our faults, and, in all weakness and humility, upon our bended marrow bones we ask their forgiveness, promising that in future we will give them no cause for anything but the best of feeling toward us. To young Wilson and the unreliable, as we have wickedly termed them, we feel that no apology we can make begins to atone for the many insults we have given them. Toward these gentlemen we have been as mean as a man could be, and we have always prided ourselves on this base quality. We feel that we are the least of all humanity, as it were. We will now go in sackcloth and ashes for the next forty days." This in his own paper over his own signature was a body-blow, but it had the effect of curing his cold. He was back in the office forthwith, and in the next morning's issue denounced his betrayer. We are to blame for giving the unreliable an opportunity to misrepresent us, and therefore refrain from repining to any great extent at the result. We simply claim the right to deny the truth of every statement made by him in 
yesterday's paper to annul all apologies he coined as coming from us and to hold him up to public commiseration as a reptile endowed with no more intellect no more cultivation no more christian principle than animates and adorns the sportive jackass rabbit of the sierras we have done these were the things that enlivened comstock journalism once in a boxing bout mark twain got a blow on the nose which caused it to swell to an unusual size and shape he went out of town for a few days during which de quill published an extravagant account of his misfortune describing the nose and dwelling on the absurdity of mark twain's ever supposing himself to be a boxer de quill scored heavily with this item but his own doom was written soon afterward he was out riding and was thrown from his horse and bruised considerably that was mark's opportunity he gave an account of dan's disaster then commenting he said the idea of a plebeian like dan supposing he could ever ride a horse he why even the cats and the chickens laughed when they saw him go by of course he would be thrown off of course any well-bred horse wouldn't let a common underbred person like dan stay on his back when they gathered him up he was just a bag of scraps but they put him together and you'll find him at his old place in the enterprise office next week still laboring under the delusion that he's a newspaper man the author of roughing it tells of a literary periodical called the occidental started in virginia city by a mr f this was the silver-tongued tom fitch of the union an able speaker and writer vastly popular on the coast fitch came to clemens one day and said he was thinking of starting such a periodical and asked him what he thought of the venture clemens said you would succeed if anyone could but start a flower garden on the desert of sahara set up hoisting works on mount vesuvius for mining sulphur start a literary paper in virginia city <laughs> hell which was a correct estimate of the situation and the paper perished with the third issue it was of no consequence except that it contained what was probably the first attempt at that modern literary abortion the composite novel also it died too soon to publish mark twain's first verses of any pretension though still of modest merit the aged pilot man which were thereby saved for roughing it visiting virginia now it seems curious that any of these things could have happened there the comstock has become little more than a memory virginia and gold hill are so quiet so voiceless as to constitute scarcely an echo of the past the international hotel that once so splendid edifice through whose portholes the tide of opulent life then ebbed and flowed is all but deserted now one may wander at will through its dingy corridors and among its faded fripperies seeking in vain for attendance or hospitality the lavish welcome of a vanished day those things were not lacking once and the stream of wealth tossed up and down the stair and billowed up c street an ebullient tide of metals and men from which millionaires would be struck out and individuals known in national affairs william m stewart who would one day become a united states senator was there an unnoticed unit and john mckay and james g fair one a senator by and by and both millionaires but poor enough then fair with a pick on his shoulder and mckay too at first though he presently became a mine superintendent once in those days mark twain banteringly offered to trade businesses with mckay no mckay said i can't trade 
my business is not worth as much as yours i have never swindled anybody and i don't intend to begin now neither of those men could dream that within ten years their names would be international property that in due course nevada would propose statues to their memory such things came out of the comstock such things spring out of every turbulent frontier end of chapter forty two repertorial days read by john greenman this is section forty three of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne volume one part one eighteen thirty five to eighteen sixty six chapter forty three artemus ward madame caprell's warning concerning mark twain's health at twenty-eight would seem to have been justified high-strung and neurotic the strain of newspaper work and the tumult of the comstock had told on him as in later life he was subject to bronchial colds and more than once that year he found it necessary to drop all work and rest for a time at steamboat springs a place near virginia city where there were boiling springs and steaming fissures in the mountainside and a comfortable hotel he contributed from there sketches somewhat more literary in form than any of his previous work curing a cold is a more or less exaggerated account of his ills included in the sketches new and old information for the million and advice to good little girls included in the jumping frog collection 1867 but omitted from the sketches are also believed to belong to this period a portion of a playful letter to his mother written from the springs still exists you have given my vanity a deadly thrust behold i am prone to boast of having the widest reputation as a local editor of any man on the pacific coast and you gravely come forward and tell me if i work hard and attend closely to my business i may aspire to a place on a big san francisco daily some day there's a comment on human vanity for you why blast it i was under the impression that i could get such a situation as that any time i asked for it but i don't want it no paper in the united states can afford to pay me what my place on the enterprise is worth if i were not naturally a lazy idle good-for-nothing vagabond i could make it pay me twenty thousand dollars a year but i don't suppose i shall ever be any account i lead an easy life though and i don't care a cent whether school keeps or not everybody knows me and i fare like a prince wherever i go be it on this side of the mountain or the other and i am proud to say i am the most conceited ass in the territory you think that picture looks old well i can't help it in reality i'm not as old as i was when i was eighteen which was a true statement so far as his general attitude was concerned at eighteen in new york and philadelphia his letters had been grave reflective advisory now they were mostly banter and froth lightly indifferent to the serious side of things though perhaps only pretendedly so for the picture did look old from the shock and circumstance of his brother's death he had never recovered he was barely twenty-eight from the picture he might have been a man of forty it was that year that artemus ward charles f brown came to virginia city there was a fine opera house in virginia 
and any attraction that billed San Francisco did not fail to play to the Comstock. Ward intended staying only a few days to deliver his lectures, but the whirl of the Comstock caught him like a maelstrom, and he remained three weeks. He made the Enterprise office his headquarters and fairly reveled in the company he found there. He and Mark Twain became boon companions, each recognized in the other a kindred spirit. With Goodman, De Quill, and McCarthy, also E. E. Hingston, Ward's agent, a companionable fellow, they usually dined at Chaumont's, Virginia's high-toned French restaurant. Those were three memorable weeks in Mark Twain's life. Artemus Ward was in the height of his fame, and he encouraged his newfound brother humorist and prophesied great things of him. Clemens, on his side, measured himself by this man who had achieved fame, and perhaps with good reason concluded that Ward's estimate was correct, that he too could win fame and honor once he got a start. If he had lacked ambition before Ward's visit, the latter's unqualified approval inspired him with that priceless article of equipment. He put his soul into entertaining the visitor during those three weeks, and it was apparent to their associates that he was at least Ward's equal in mental stature and originality. Goodman and the others began to realize that for Mark Twain the rewards of the future were to be measured only by his resolution and ability to hold out. On Christmas Eve Artemis lectured in Silver City, and afterward came to the Enterprise office to give the boys a farewell dinner. The Enterprise always published a Christmas carol, and Goodman sat at his desk writing it. He was just finishing as Ward came in. "'Slave! Slave!' said Artemis. "'Come out and let me banish care from you!' They got the boys and all went over to Chaumont's, where Ward commanded Goodman to order the dinner. When the cocktails came on, Artemis lifted his glass and said, "'I give you Upper Canada!' The company rose, drank the toast in serious silence. Then Goodman said, "'Of course, Artemis, it's all right. Uh, but uh, why did you give us Upper Canada?' "'Because I don't want it myself,' said Ward gravely. Then began a rising tide of humor that could hardly be matched in the world today. Mark Twain had awakened to a fuller power. Artemis Ward was in his prime. They were giants of a race that became extinct when Mark Twain died. The youth, the wine, the whirl of lights and life, the tumult of the shouting street. It was as if an electric stream of inspiration poured into those two human dynamos and sent them into a dazzling, scintillating whirl. All gone, as evanescent as forgotten, as the lightnings of that vanished time. Out of that vast feasting and entertainment only a trifling morsel remains. Ward now and then asked Goodman why he did not join in the banter. Goodman said, "'I'm preparing a joke, Artemis.' but I'm keeping it for the present. It was near daybreak when Ward at last called for the bill. It was two hundred and thirty-seven dollars. What? exclaimed Artemis. That's my joke, said Goodman. But I was only exclaiming because it was not twice as much, returned Ward. He paid it amid laughter, and they went out into the early morning air. It was fresh and fine outside, not yet light enough to see clearly. Artemis threw his face up to the sky and said, I feel glorious. I feel like walking on the roofs. Virginia was built on the steep hillside, and the eaves of some of the houses almost touched the ground behind them. There is your chance, Artemis, Goodman said, pointing to a row of these houses all about of a height. Artemis grabbed Mark Twain, and they stepped out upon the long string of roofs and walked their full length, arm in arm. Presently the others noticed a lonely policeman cocking his revolver and getting ready to aim in their direction. Goodman called to him, "'Wait a minute! What are you going to do?' "'I am going to shoot those burglars,' he said. "'Don't for your life. Those are not burglars. That's Mark Twain and Artemis Ward.' The roof-walkers returned, and the party went down the street to a corner across from the International Hotel. A saloon was there, with a barrel lying in front, 
used perhaps for a sort of sign artemus climbed astride the barrel and somebody brought a beer-glass and put it in his hand virginia city looks out over the eastward desert morning was just breaking upon the distant range the scene as beautiful as when the sunrise beams across the plain of memnon the city was not yet awake the only living creatures in sight were the group of belated diners with artemus ward as king gambrinus pouring a libation to the sunrise that was the beginning of a week of glory the farewell dinner became a series at the close of one convivial session artemus went to a concert hall the melodeon blacked his face and delivered a speech he got away from virginia about the close of the year a day or two later he wrote from austin nevada to his new-found comrade as my dearest love recalling the happiness of his stay i shall always remember virginia as a bright spot in my existence as all others must or rather cannot be as it were then reflectively he adds some of the finest intellects in the world have been blunted by liquor rare artemus ward and rare mark twain if there lies somewhere a place of meeting and remembrance they have not failed to recall there those closing days of sixty three end of chapter forty three artemus ward read by john greenman this is section forty four of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography by albert bigelow payne volume one part one eighteen thirty five to eighteen sixty six chapter forty four governor of the third house with artemus ward's encouragement clemens began to think of extending his audience eastward the new york sunday mercury published literary matter ward had urged him to try this market and promised to write a special letter to the editors introducing mark twain and his work clemens prepared a sketch of the comstock variety scarcely refined in character and full of personal allusion a humor not suited to the present-day reader its general subject was children it contained some absurd remedies supposedly sent to his old pilot friend zeb leavenworth and was written as much for a joke on that good-natured soul as for profit or reputation i wrote it especially for beck jolly's use the author declares in a letter to his mother so he could pester zeb with it we cannot know to-day whether zeb was pestered or not a faded clipping is all that remains of the incident as literature the article properly enough is lost to the world at large it is only worth remembering as his metropolitan beginning yet he must have thought rather highly of it his estimation of his own work was always unsafe for in the letter above quoted he adds i cannot write regularly for the mercury of course i shan't have time but sometimes i throw off a pearl there is no self-conceit about that i beg you to observe which ought for the eternal welfare of my race to have a more extensive circulation than is afforded by a local daily paper and if fitzhugh ludlow author of the hashish eater comes your way uh, treat him well he published a high encomium upon mark twain the same being eminently just and truthful i beseech you to believe in a san francisco paper artemus ward said that when my gorgeous talents were publicly acknowledged by such high authority i ought to appreciate them myself leave sagebrush obscurity and journey to new york with him as he wanted me to do but i preferred not to burst upon the new york public too suddenly and brilliantly so 
I concluded to remain here. He was in Carson City when this was written, preparing for the opening of the next legislature. He was beyond question now the most conspicuous figure of the capital, also the most wholesomely respected, for his influence had become very large. It was said that he could control more votes than any legislative member, and with his friends, Simmons and Claggett, could pass or defeat any bill offered. The enterprise was a powerful organ to be courted and dreaded, and Mark Twain had become its chief tribune. That he was fearless, merciless, and incorruptible, without doubt had a salutary influence on that legislative session. He reveled in his power, but it is not recorded that he ever abused it. He got a bill passed, largely increasing Orion's official fees, but this was a crying need and was so recognized. He made no secret promises, none at all, that he did not intend to fulfill. Sam's word was as fixed as fate, Orion records, and it may be added that he was morally as fearless. The two houses of the last territorial legislature of Nevada assembled January 12, 1864. Nevada became a state October 31, 1864. A few days later a third house was organized, an institution quite in keeping with the happy atmosphere of that day and locality, for it was a burlesque organization, and Mark Twain was selected as its governor. The new house prepared to make a public occasion of this first session, and its governor was required to furnish a message. Then it was decided to make it a church benefit. The letters exchanged concerning this proposition still exist. They explain themselves. Carson City, January 23, 1864. Governor Mark Twain understanding from certain members of the third house of the territorial legislature that that body will have effected a permanent organization within a day or two and be ready for the reception of your third annual message there had been no former message this was regarded as a great joke we desire to ask your permission and that of the third house to turn the affair to the benefit of the church by charging toll roads franchises and other persons a dollar apiece for the privilege of listening to your communication s pixley g a sears trustees carson city january twenty third eighteen sixty four gentlemen certainly if the public can find anything in a grave state paper worth paying a dollar for i am willing they should pay that amount or any other and although i am not a very dusty christian myself i take an absorbing interest in religious affairs and would willingly inflict my annual message upon the church itself if it might derive benefit thereby you can charge what you please i promise the public no amusement but i do promise a reasonable amount of instruction i am responsible to the third house only and i hope to be permitted to make it exceedingly warm for that body without caring whether the sympathies of the public and the church be enlisted in their favor and against myself or not. Respectfully, Mark Twain. Mark Twain's reply is closely related to his later style in phrase and thought. It might have been written by him at almost any subsequent period. Perhaps his association with Artemus Ward had awakened a new perception of the humorous idea, a humor of repression, of understatement. He forgot this often enough, then and afterward, and gave his riotous fancy free rein. But on the whole, the simpler, less florid form seemingly began to attract him more and more. 
his address as governor of the third house has not been preserved but those who attended always afterward referred to it as the greatest effort of his life perhaps for that audience and that time this verdict was justified it was his first great public opportunity on the stage about him sat the membership of the third house the building itself was packed the aisles full he knew he could let himself go in burlesque and satire and he did he was unsparing in his ridicule of the governor the officials in general the legislative members and of individual citizens from the beginning to the end of his address the audience was in a storm of laughter and applause with the exception of the dinner speech made to the printers in keokuk it was his first public utterance the beginning of a lifelong series of triumphs only one thing marred his success little carrie pixley daughter of one of the trustees had promised to be present and sit in a box next the stage it was like him to be fond of the child and he had promised to send a carriage for her often during his address he glanced toward the box but it remained empty when the affair was ended he drove home with her father to inquire the reason they found the little girl in all her finery weeping on the bed then he remembered he had forgotten to send the carriage and that was like him too for his third house address judge a w sandy baldwin and theodore winters presented him with a gold watch inscribed to governor mark twain he was more in demand now than ever no social occasion was regarded as complete without him his doings were related daily and his sayings repeated on the streets most of these things have passed away now but a few are still recalled with smiles once when conundrums were being asked at a party he was urged to make one well he said why am i like the pacific ocean several guesses were made but none satisfied him finally all gave it up tell us mark why are you like the pacific ocean i don't know he drawled i was just asking for information at another time when a young man insisted on singing a song of eternal length the chorus of which was i'm going home i'm going home i'm going home to-morrow mark twain put his head in the window and said pleadingly for god's sake go to-night but he was also fond of quieter society sometimes after the turmoil of a legislative morning he would drop in to miss kasia clapp's school and listen to the exercises or would call on colonel curry old curry old abe curry and if the colonel happened to be away he would talk with mrs curry a motherly soul still alive at ninety-three in nineteen ten and tell her of his hannibal boyhood or his river and his mining adventures and keep her laughing until the tears ran he was a great pedestrian in those days sometimes he walked from virginia to carson stopping at colonel curry's as he came in for rest and refreshment mrs curry he said once i have seen tireder men than i am and lazier men but they were dead men he liked the home feeling there the peace and motherly interest deep down he was lonely and homesick he was always so away from his own kindred clemens returned now to virginia city and like all other men who ever met her became briefly fascinated by the charms of ada isaacs menken who was playing mazeppa at the virginia opera house all men kings poets priests prize-fighters fell under menken's spell dan de quill and mark twain entered into a daily contest as to who could lavish the most fervid praise on her in the enterprise the latter carried her his literary work to criticize he confesses this in one of his home letters perhaps with a sort of pride i took it over to show to miss menken the actress 
Orphus C. Ken's wife. She is a literary cuss herself. She has a beautiful white hand, but her handwriting is infamous. She writes fast, and her chirography is of the door-plate order. Her letters are immense. I gave her a conundrum, thus. My dear madam, why ought your hand to retain its present grace and beauty always? Because you fool away devilish little of it on your manuscript. But Mencken was gone presently, and when he saw her again somewhat later in San Francisco, his madness would have seemed to have been allayed. End of chapter 44 The Governor of the Third House Read by John Greenman This is section 45 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography by Albert Bigelow Payne Volume 1, Part 1 1835 to 1866. Chapter 45. A Comstock Duel. The success, such as it was, of his occasional contributions to the New York Sunday Mercury stirred Mark Twain's ambition for a wider field of labor. Circumstance, always ready to meet his wishes, offered assistance, though in an unexpected form. Goodman, temporarily absent, had left Clemens in editorial charge. As in that earlier day, when Orion had visited Tennessee and returned to find his paper in a hot personal warfare with certain injured citizens, so the Enterprise, under the same management, had stirred up trouble. It was just at the time of the Flower Sack Sanitary Fund, the story of which is related at length in Roughing It, in the general hilarity of this occasion, certain enterprise paragraphs of criticism or ridicule had incurred the displeasure of various individuals whose cause, naturally enough, had been espoused by a rival paper, the Chronicle. Very soon the original grievance, whatever it was, was lost sight of in the fireworks and vitriol throwing of personal recrimination between Mark Twain and the Chronicle editor, then a Mr. Laird. A point had been reached at length when only a call for bloodshed, a challenge, could satisfy either the staff or the readers of the two papers. Men were killed every week for milder things than the editors had spoken each of the other. Joe Goodman himself, not so long before, had fought a duel with a union editor, Tom Fitch, and shot him in the leg, so making of him a friend, and a lame man for life. In Joe's absence, the prestige of the paper must be maintained. Mark Twain himself has told in burlesque the story of his duel, keeping somewhat nearer to the fact than was his custom in such writing, as may be seen by comparing it with the account of his abettor and second, of course, Steve Gillis. The account is from Mr. Gillis's own hand. When Joe went away, he left Sam in editorial charge of the paper. That was a dangerous thing to do. Nobody could ever tell what Sam was going to write. Something he said stirred up Mr. Laird of the Chronicle, who wrote a reply of a very severe kind. He said some things that we told Mark could only be wiped out with blood. Those were the days when almost every man in Virginia City had fought with pistols, either impromptu or premeditated duels. I had been in several, uh, but then mine didn't count. Most of them were of the impromptu kind. Mark hadn't had any yet, and we thought it about time that his baptism took place. He was not eager for it. He was averse to violence. But we finally prevailed upon him to send Laird a challenge, and when Laird did not send a reply at once, we insisted on Mark sending him another challenge, by which time he had made himself believe that he really wanted to fight as much as we wanted him to do. Laird concluded to fight, at last. I helped Mark get up some of the letters, and a man who would not fight after such letters did not belong in Virginia City in those days. Laird's acceptance of Mark's challenge came along about midnight, I think, 
after the papers had gone to press. The meeting was to take place next morning at sunrise. Of course I was selected as Mark's second, and at daybreak I had him up and out for some lessons in pistol practice before meeting Laird. I didn't have to wake him. He had not been asleep. We had been talking since midnight over the duel that was coming. I had been telling him of the different duels in which I had taken part, either as principal or second, and how many men I had helped to kill and bury, and how it was a good plan to make a will, even if one had not much to leave. It always looked well, I told him, and seemed to be a proper thing to do before going into a duel. So Mark made a will with a sort of gloomy satisfaction, and as soon as it was light enough to see, we went out to a little ravine near the meeting place, and I set up a board for him to shoot at. He would step out, raise that big pistol, and when I would count three he would shut his eyes and pull the trigger. Of course he didn't hit anything. He did not come anywhere near hitting anything. Just then we heard somebody shooting over in the next ravine. Sam said, "'What's that, Steve?' "'Why,' I said, "'that's loud. His seconds are practicing him over there.' It didn't make my principal any more cheerful to hear that pistol go off every few seconds over there. Just then I saw a little mud-hen light on some sagebrush about thirty yards away. "'Mark,' I said, "'let me have that pistol. I'll show you how to shoot.' He handed it to me, and I let go at the bird and shot its head off clean. About that time Laird and his second came over the ridge to meet us. I saw them coming and handed Mark back the pistol. We were looking at the bird when they came up. "'Who did that?' asked Laird's second. "'Sam,' I said. "'How far off was it?' "'Oh, about thirty yards.' "'Can you do it again?' "'Of course,' I said. "'Every time.' He could do it twice that far. Loud's second turned to his principal. Laird, he said, you don't want to fight that man. It's just like suicide. You'd better settle this thing now. So there was a settlement. Laird took back all he had said. Mark said he really had nothing against Laird. The discussion had been purely journalistic and did not need to be settled in blood. He said that both he and Laird were probably the victims of their friends. I remember one of the things Laird said when his second told him he had better not fight. Fight? Hell no! I'm not going to be murdered by that damn desperado! Sam had sent another challenge to a man named Cutler, who had been somehow mixed up with the muss and had written Sam an insulting letter. But Cutler was out of town at the time, and before he got back we had received word from Jerry Driscoll, foreman of the grand jury, that the law just passed making a duel a penitentiary offense for both principal and second was to be strictly enforced and unless we got out of town in a limited number of hours we would be the first examples to test the new law we concluded to go and when the stage left next morning for san francisco we were on the outside seat joe goodman had returned by this time and agreed to accompany us as far as hennis pass we were all in good spirits and glad we were alive, so Joe did not stop when he got to Hennis Pass, but kept on. Now and then he would say, Well, I better be going back pretty soon. But he didn't go, and in the end he did not go back at all, but went with us clear to San Francisco, and we had a royal good time all the way. I never knew any series of duels to close so happily. So ended Mark Twain's career on the Comstock. He had come to it a weary pilgrim, discouraged and unknown. He was leaving it with a new name and fame, elate, triumphant, even if a fugitive. End of chapter 45 A Comstock Duel Read by John Greenman